Uh, and then I live in a state with a governor that's so bold and so courageous to stand up uh, against what a lot of people in society and what culture may say is right. But he's really standing for biblical truth. And so I support that at all levels. Uh, I've communicated that. Uh, and, you know, as an African-American man, I do catch a lot of heat uh, for my support. You know, many uh, on the left try to make Governor DeSantis out as racist, but you know, in my in my mind, a racist doesn't stand up for the voiceless and the underserved the way that he has. And so, I will continue uh, to support my governor, uh, and I hope that he remains strong on this issue so that other states follow his lead. And now to our top story: the fight over Disney, the once family-friendly entertainment colossus, is experiencing a major crisis following two high-profile controversies. First its vocal opposition to the recent passage of a Florida law that bans the teaching of transgenderism to children as young as kindergarten. And also, Florida Governor Ron DeSantis' retaliation against Disney by revoking its special district status that allows it, in effect, to govern itself. Disneyland is dedicated to the ideals, the dreams, and the hard facts that have created America with the hope that it will be a source of joy and inspiration to all the world. Utopian visions often come to a crashing halt when reality rips off the facade. Disney's stock price dropped today to $115 a share, from its high last year of $200, after Florida Republican Governor Ron DeSantis signed a bill that will dissolve by June of next year the Reedy Creek Improvement District, a so-called special district that makes Disney its own government, the master of its own kingdom. The action came after Disney's vocal opposition to a state law that bans the teaching of transsexualism in kindergarten through third grade, what was called in the progressive media the Don't Say Gay Bill. I'm, I'm here as a mother of, of two queer children, actually, um, uh, one transgender child um, um, and one pansexual child. Um, I feel a responsibility to speak um, not just for myself, but for them. Ron DeSantis did something that none of the Disney executives did. He actually read that bill that he signed. Because if the Disney people had read it, they would realize that there's nothing in that bill, nothing that says don't say gay. That is something that has been created by critics who want to try to make it a controversial bill. Uh, Disney ought to be proud to support that bill. They used to be family friendly, kid friendly. The special district designation once, but no longer applies to Disney's utopian neighborhood called Celebration, just adjacent to Disney World in Orlando. In 2019, the Daily Beast reported, quote, the cracks in Celebration's utopian facade have been evident for years. There were major segregation issues. The school, which didn't assign homework, grades, or even books, was losing students by the dozens. The recession had bankrupted local businesses and pushed homes to foreclosure. And in one brutal week of 2010, the town experienced its first murder. Later, when Disney sold Celebration's commercial district, its new management, quote, let the place fall to pieces and started bleeding the residents dry. DeSantis' removal of the special district status for Disney has sparked a broader examination of special districts. Florida has 1,800 of them. There are 38,000 nationwide. The Wall Street Journal editorializes, quote, most are superfluous, obscure, and burdensome. There are means to escape citizen limitations on government power and should be brought under control of regular voters and local governments again. Disney is also facing scrutiny that could blossom into a bigger crisis should Republicans win control of Congress. It is increasingly beholden to the Communist Party of China. 57% of Disney's China Park is owned by the Shanghai Shendai Group, a subsidiary of the Shanghai government. As the Harvard International Review reported, quote, Disney has a long history of censoring its films to remain in the CCP's good graces. And joining us now is Jack Brewer, the founder of the Jack Brewer Foundation. Jack Brewer, great to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. I'm very excited to join your show. Uh, you're taking a lot of flack for being a supporter of Governor DeSantis and his position with this whole Disney thing and, and the transgender issue in the state of Florida. Why are you supporting him? Uh, I support righteousness. First off, you know, I was raised... Uh, on the principles of God and, and to follow the word of God in the Bible uh, as my truth. And so with that, as I, you know, go into this season of my life where, you know, I'm a parent and 
I'm a father, I'm a mentor to so many kids, and I have to stand for that truth. And when I see um, that folks uh, with power are, are coming and trying to indoctrinate uh, the minds of children, uh, and then I live in a state with a governor that's so bold and so courageous to stand up uh, against what a lot of people in society and what culture may say is right, but he's really standing for biblical truth. And so I support that at all levels. Uh, I've communicated that. Uh, and, you know, as an African-American man, I do catch a lot of heat uh, for my support. You know, many uh, on the left try to make Governor DeSantis out as racist. But, you know, in my in my mind, a racist doesn't stand up for the voiceless and the underserved the way that he has. And so I will continue uh, to support my governor. Uh, and I hope that he remains strong on this issue so that other states follow his lead. Well, it's not the first time you've gone against the grain in the, in the pursuit of righteousness. You were a President Obama voter, but uh, you're also a President Trump voter. That's right. That's right. And, you know, it, it, it comes back to righteousness. You know, President Trump uh, was the first president to stand up for life and against abortion. Uh, and as a man who's had committed abortions myself, I had to repent for that. And so I want to follow uh, men who are going to stand up against things uh, like massive abortions and aborting babies at nine months and all these un uh, just crazy, ridiculous things. You know, President Trump stood for all of that. You know, he stood for those uh, prisoners that were locked up in prison cells across America. You know, he passed the First Step Act, which was so bold uh, at that time. Many Republicans didn't even vote for it. So he had to go and, and pass this bipartisan bill because he knew it was righteous. And he knows the Bible says, visit those in prison as if uh, we're in prison our, uh, ourselves, like it reads in Hebrew 13 and 3. So th these are the things that I try to support uh, as a father, uh, as, a, as a devout Christian, someone who's repentant to Christ Jesus as my Lord and Savior, uh, I try to make sure that the policies that I push and support uh, align with biblical uh, policy. And so sometimes things aren't political, they're actually spiritual. Uh, and that's the way I try to pursue them and, and align myself uh, in the voice that God's blessed me with. You know, you talk to a lot of those guys who, who are in prison, and there's a very common thread that runs throughout the whole thing. And it's a lot of these guys did not have fathers in their lives. Mm -hmm. And, and that's one of the key things that you really are, are tapped into, fatherlessness. And I want to get into that you, in a backhanded, backhanded kind of a way. And here's what I'm talking about. Uh, you had a very successful football career, SMU University, then the University of Minnesota, the Minnesota Vikings, several other NFL teams. You had some success. You had some failures. And I want to hone in on the failures now because... I've often thought that the NFL is a, is a pure meritocracy. You either produce or you're gone. And I think few Americans, few people can really understand what it's like to get that phone call from the coach, I want to, I want to see you now. And you're walking down the hallway, your heart's racing, what's my future? You know, am I gonna get this big paycheck or not? You walk in there and the coach sits down and tells you, you know, I really appreciate all the hard work you've put into this, the tremendous effort and all the bangs and bruises you've, you've incurred here. But we've got this young guy who runs the 50-yard dash and so-and-so, <laughs> and uh, I'm sorry, we got to let you go. And then you walk out of there, and, it, and it's, it's the purest form of rejection a human being can experience, really. It really is. And, you know, I don't get a chance to talk about this on television. So uh, I, I am very grateful for you to even bring this up. Uh, but, you know, every Tuesday they bring in a busload of people uh, to try out for your position. And so it's one of the most competitive, if not the most competitive jobs uh, in America, because each and every week you are up to just be let go. And there are no long term guaranteed contracts uh, for the majority of NFL players. And so, you know, that really teaches you something. It, it teaches you uh, one to be grateful and thankful for what you have, but then to always be on your game. And I think that's what the National Football League did for me. You know, I had to have those those talks twice. You know, I was cut for the first time uh, as a captain and the second time I was cut as a captain. So imagine being a team captain, mm. um, you know, playing at the top of your game, but then being let go. Uh, I've, I've felt that, you know, both times were, were due to injuries, but that doesn't matter. They weren't willing to yeah. keep me on the roster through my injury. Uh, they would they would rather replace me. And so you're exactly right. I think, you know, as an American, 
Um, you know, we have so many blessings and so many opportunities, but, uh, but sometimes we're, we're creating this culture that uh, promotes to our kids and teaches folks to bow down when pressure gets on and not to fight through things and to, uh, that everybody should be just given a little peace. That's not how it yeah. works. You're supposed to fight for it. You know, let, the, me, let me interrupt you here. Us. Let me interrupt you here yeah. because I want to cut to the chase here. I was talking about the backhanded way. I wanted to get into this. I suspect, I have a strong feeling that the fact that you had a really involved father helped you cope mm. with those major rejections in life? No doubt. I mean, my dad did not play. Um, I knew when he looked at me, I knew to straighten up. Uh, and he put the fear of God in me. You know, I've always respected my elders, respected law enforcement and teachers. Uh, and I think that's where it comes from. It's that foundational principle uh, that a child needs at its core. And the Bible tells us to don't spare the ride or we hate our son. Uh, and that's what, how my house was ran. And, and, and he gave me that foundation. He pushed me in sports. Even when I thought I may not want to play, he pushed me anyway, knowing that once I got to a certain age, that that passion would come. And that's exactly what happened. Uh, and so when you start as a young child to be held accountable, uh, that's really what you the behavior you get used to um, appreciate and it becomes who you are. And so uh, you're exactly right that those foundational principles come from my father, Eddie Jack Brewer.